All right, over the last few months, I've had quite a few people ask me if I would ship a snake, and a lot of people said, hey, if you ship snakes, I will buy one today. I'll even buy a normal and pay for the shipping. And, you know, pretty much up until this point, what I've pretty much done is I've only sold snakes at the reptile shows here locally in Colorado. And I'm kind of, you know, for the last couple of months, I've been kind of, you know, considering switching how I approach selling my snakes. And I've pretty much decided that this fall, instead of doing the reptile shows, I'm going to start selling and shipping my snakes online. So if you're looking for one of my snakes, I'm, I've decided that this fall I'm going to skip the shows and ship out those snakes. So essentially what you use is you use a box like this. This is a shipping box. You can only ship them through FedEx. And, and it's FedEx... <laughs> FedEx overnight. What is Bobby doing here? <laughs> so, so essentially what you do is you ship them in a box like this and it comes to your door pretty much overnight. You have to ship overnight. And the thing that I really don't like about shipping is shipping to your door, you know, getting beat up in the, in the FedEx truck. So what I'm thinking of doing is shipping to your local FedEx center. And I've, I've shipped in a lot of snakes here. I bought a lot of stuff online. And that seems like the safest option. It doesn't get, you know, bounced around in the back of a truck. Goes right to the shipping center and the snakes are always perfectly fine. I've had some pretty beat up snakes shipping in the back of a truck coming to my house up here in the mountains, it's been pretty rough on them. So I pretty much decided that I'm gonna ship and I'm gonna ship only to your local FedEx center so you can pick it up pretty much at your leisure. If they deliver to your door and you're not there, then you know, it goes back in the truck and back in the system, which is not really good for the snake. And another thing I'm thinking is when I ship snakes, it's pretty stressful on the snake to, to go through the, the whole shipping process. So what I'm thinking is, is having these snakes eat at least six to 10 rodents, I'm thinking maybe 10, where you can get them from live mice. You have to start them on live mice. As a matter of fact, I had someone comment in this in one of my videos, I said, hey, I've been trying to feed my, my, my new hatchling live rats, and let me tell you, I don't care what any pet store says, live rats will not work for new hatchlings. You absolutely need live mice, like a little hopper mouse. And then you pretty much switch from a live mouse over to frozen thawed mice, and then switch over to pretty much to live rats, and then you go to a frozen thawed rat. And I'm hoping I can walk my snakes all the way through until when you're getting the snake through the mail, you can hit the ground running with a frozen thawed rat. And that is really what you know most people are looking for. It's really easy to keep frozen rats in your freezer instead of having to worry with you know with live rodents. Live rodents are definitely a challenge. Let me tell you, it's it's a whole nother level. I probably spend as much time maintaining my rodents as I do my snakes. So I really want them well started and shipped to the FedEx Center. I'm gonna start shipping this fall and really uh, the, doing the shows is you know it's really exciting but it's it really takes a toll on a person especially these last two shows back to back weekends and you're standing for a long time at the shows and it's it's nice to meet the people but you know there's an, another expense on top of everything else some people actually lose quite a bit of money at these shows setting up tables you're paying like a hundred 125 dollars a table and some guys as a matter of fact i had someone come up to me the other day said they got a really big booth they actually lost like $2,500 at the show and it almost totally wiped them out until the next show when they had some really good sales. So that's another thing. I say between two shows, I spend anywhere between $500 and $800. It depends on, you know, if I have helpers and I'm paying them, I'm paying for the table and the gas going back and forth and everything else. So it, it'll actually save me money. It'll be easier to kind of figure out what I want to sell and what I want to keep because when I go to a show a lot of times what I'll do is I'll pull some of the stuff that I really don't want to sell just to fill up my display cases and sure enough it sells at the show it's good money but the problem is is some of that stuff you know I kind of wish I would keep it for future breeding in the future years so this way I can really dial in exactly what I want and exactly what I want to, to sell to you guys so another thing I'm kind of thinking about selling snakes 
uh, is I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out how to do kind of a kind of a uh, kind of like an auction style sale, kind of like eBay, but I don't think you can sell snakes on eBay. If you guys know of a good auction style site where you can sell snakes, people can bid on them. I think that would be pretty cool. I don't know what Bobby's doing on top of my head. This crazy snake. <laughs> but anyway, back what was I saying before the snake distracted me? Anyway, so you know, there's a lot of people that have been interested in supporting me financially and kind of my vision for this whole project and the whole kind of the ball python game here is really what, where I want to get to is I want to get these snakes and rodents out of my basement and into a real facility where I can expand a little bit, hire some employees and have the employees take care of kind of the day-to-day -day maintenance and I can really focus on the educational style vlogs that I give to you guys every day. So what I'm going to do today is I actually looked up in my rack. I have another snake laying eggs. As a matter of fact, it's the second to the last. I think I might have one more that might lay eggs. So it's kind of on the tail end of the breeding season. This one was actually a normal paired with my Coral Glow 100% uh, head pie. Bobby's just kind of all over the place today. And so what I want to do is I want to set up those eggs for you today. And we'll go through the whole process, setting them up, putting them in the, in the incubator. And then what I want to do is I want to show you what I have in my incubator. I probably have, I'm probably up to like 50 or 60 eggs. And these are the snakes that are going to hatch. And the, the, those are the snakes that I'm going to sell in the fall. So this clutch will be 50% coral glows. 50% normals and all of them will be 50% het pied so it should be an interesting clutch. Alright so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually take that female from the rack up here and I'm going to put her down in the boa tub get her off of her eggs and she'll be in the boa tub until we actually pull those eggs out and put it in the incubator and what I need for this one is I need a step stool because she is way up on the top up here and let's see how many eggs she is and if she's laid them all or if she still has some in her belly I've uh, been kind of looking at her and I really can't tell I pulled it out a little bit earlier and she kind of looks uh, it's hard to tell I guess unless you actually pull her off the eggs but she's got one that kind of came out of the whole coil right here and she is hissing, she is not happy. Let's even get her off these eggs. <laughs> she is hissing. <laughs> she is not happy. Let's see here. <laughs> Usually if I can start with her tail, it looks like she's laid them all here. Let's see if I can get her off. Oh, I see one slug. That might be, I think that's like the second slug of the year. Oh, those are pretty fresh eggs, actually. And it looks like, let's see, in her belly, it looks like she is a, she's got some really body condition for just laying. Let me tell you, this, this is a really beefy snake. She's looking really good. Let me see if I can get off the stool and get her down here. But it looks like she's laid all the eggs. Doesn't really look like she has any in her body. All right, so take a look at this wild bunch of eggs. It's usually more in uh, kind of a clump together. This is kind of really spread out, which is really interesting. And a lot of these eggs, they are already, I think <laughs> almost all of them, are completely separated. That is pretty amazing. And I just have one slug. So the slug is essentially an infertile egg that won't hatch. So this is, you know, you can have this for breakfast. I actually tried to eat one of these ones and it is, uh, I found it extremely disgusting. I don't like, actually I put it in the refrigerator and it turned really yellow and hard when it came out. It was really goopy. As a matter of fact, I had one of these and I just kept it at room temperature and it still turned really hard. So if you're thinking about eating one, I would probably eat it right after it comes out. This is probably the perfect time to eat a snake egg. Not that I'm going to eat that egg. That is a little extreme. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to candle these eggs and figure out where the, the embryo is. So let me turn out some of these lights. Essentially what I use is I have a little pen light that I use to candle them and then I turn out 
all my main lights here. Let me flip all these switches and bulbs and everything. And what I'm going to do is, you can tell at first glance, these have been laid quite a while ago, I'd say for a few hours. And if you look right here on the top, it kind of jiggles a little bit. That is the embryo, and that is what you want facing up in the egg box in the incubator. And a lot of people say, you know, there's been studies done where if you put the embryo on top, you actually get a better hatch rate with the embryo on top. This one's kind of has an embryo on the side, which is kind of interesting. So what I do is I just kind of go through them, make sure all the embryos are marked. This is a 10 egg clutch, it's pretty amazing. I can't believe that girl laid 10 eggs. So on average we should get 5 coral glows and 5 normals, which would be pretty awesome if we hit the odds. And the odds can kind of play tricks on you. I've actually seen some people where they'll breed like a bamboo to a normal and get 100% bamboos. <laughs> and it's like, what are the odds of that? Of course, it could always flip the other way. You breed something and you end up with a whole clutch of normals. It's just kind of the luck of the draw. But I'd say on average, if you're producing like hundreds of eggs, you know, it's pretty much averages out over the long haul. And I think pretty much last year, my average number of eggs per snake was like six and a half eggs overall. So getting these clutches of nine or 10 eggs, I had one that actually laid 13 eggs, and I think it was one or two slugs on that one, but it was pretty incredible. This one was actually, um, this one was actually an 11 egg clutch because one of them was a slug, and that is a really, <laughs> really big clutch of eggs. It's pretty amazing. All right, from here, what I do is I set up my egg boxes, and essentially I just use these little plastic totes and a little egg crate screen on the bottom. If you've been watching my videos, you've probably seen me do this before. And I add pretty much 50-50 water vermiculite and I preheat the water to about 90 degrees and then I add approximately 150 grams of water, 150 grams of vermiculite. So we are at, let's see, 147, uh, 100, 155 grams, doesn't really have to be exact. So then I zero it, and then I add 155 grams of vermiculite, and it's about, I'd say it's about 50 grams per cup. I've been doing this so long, I know almost exactly how much it is. So 100 and, let's see, that's about 150 and 155 right there. So then what you do is you just mix it up and that is it. This is the basically the substrate that lasts two months in the incubator. It's pretty long, pretty long incubation time. And what I want to do is, you know, typically I don't like to put more than six eggs per container because really you don't want the eggs touching the sides. You want to give them some room, kind of, you know, keep them away from the sides. You don't really want them to get rained on too from the vermiculite kind of raining down. And I don't really like to pack them in here real tight. And then from here what I do is I just put on this grate and then I put the eggs right on top here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up the second box. All right, so I have the box is set up and from here I just wanna move the eggs over and you can tell on this one, I kinda of have a high spot over here. You definitely want these, uh, the grate, the egg crate, kind of a screen here. Definitely want it level on there so you're not struggling with eggs rolling around or anything like that. So essentially what you do is you just put five eggs in each box and I could probably fit more eggs in there but you see, if I actually put the whole clutch, we can kind of take a look at what it would look like. It really doesn't fit in one box. You know, it's, it's a little bit overkill, so I like to have plenty of room between the eggs and the sides of the boxes. And what I do is I just kind of wedge them in like this so they don't roll around. Some people use like toothpicks or clothes pins or something like that. You can do that, but what I like to do is just kind of Put them at little angles so they they kind of you know hold each other up in the middle of the boxes just like that. And you can see they're pretty stable like that. They don't really roll around and all the embryos are up on the top. Alright, so from here what I do is I use this press and seal and I put press and seal right on top of the boxes. 
And what the press and seal does is it holds in the humidity and it allows the, the box to breathe. So even if the snakes hatch out in there, there's plenty of air and you don't have to worry about the, you know, running out of air in there or anything. You don't have to poke any holes on the sides of the container or in the press and seal or anything. It's perfectly fine. Then I just put the lids on and then from here what I'm going to do is label these boxes. All right, so here's the labels that I use. Essentially, I printed with a label maker, and this is a normal female number three. Actually, I have four normals. Cross it with my Coraglow 100% head pied laid today, and it'll hatch the 17th of August. And what I do is I put labels on the top of the box, on the lid, and on the front, just in case I mix up the lids, <laughs> I know which one's which. And you gotta keep in mind that it, you know if I'm selling online, those hatch in uh, August. So probably two months or more before these are ready. So probably like oct mid to late October, these will be ready to sell on online. All right, so here is my snake egg incubator and it is filling up really nicely. This is actually before I put those two boxes in and the newer ones are on top, so the, they really don't fit on top. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start at the bottom. These are gonna hatch next and we'll look at the dates and the pairings and kind of go through all the boxes so you know what to expect this year from some of these pairings and some of these eggs. And then what I'll do is I'll take the the basically the older ones move them down on the bottom pretty much move everything down so I can fit those two boxes up on the top all right so here's the first box this actually should start hatching in about nine days today is the 17th of June this is supposed to hatch on the 26th of June so you figure pretty much two months two months and a couple weeks from now so you're looking at you know June July August Maybe the end of August, beginning of September, I'll have the first ones for sale online. So that's kind of what we're looking at. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this press and seal. You can see how much condensation builds up in here. And some people just leave it completely alone and don't even mess with it. I like to actually remove the press and seal. Anything that drips on the eggs I kind of dry it off. Replace the press and seal, kind of remove the, the condensation underneath so it's not raining down on the eggs. And we'll also see if any of these are actually starting to hatch or if we have any bad eggs or any problems like that. So you can definitely tell on these, a little bit dripped on here. So I'm gonna grab a paper towel and clean these off. So these eggs are doing really well, I would say, for being uh, just a couple weeks away from hatching. This is really good. This is kind of what they should look like. If you don't have enough humidity in here, sometimes they'll sink down to where it's almost like a flat pancake and it pretty much doesn't develop at that point. And you really want uh, kind of plump eggs at this point. You really don't mess with them. You see one right here is kind of touching the, the side. So I'm just gonna pull that one away from the side a little bit, just kind of check on it. There's none that really look bad. You know, sometimes they'll get like green or <laughs> different color molds on them. Sometimes they get really fuzzy. And usually if you open your incubator and it smells bad, you know you have a bad egg somewhere. And I opened my incubator, it doesn't smell bad at all. So what I'm gonna do is replace this press and seal and then just put it back in the incubator and then this will definitely be one of the next videos, the egg cutting on this one. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six. That is seven eggs. Maybe we can kind of make a mental note of how many eggs we have in the incubator. Okay, one more thing about this first box. I'm not sure if I mentioned this. This was actually a cross between a pastel and a bamboo. So essentially what you're going to get is you're going to get bamboos, you'll get pastels, you'll get pastel bamboos, and you'll get some normals. Okay, so here's another box. This one actually hatches the 8th of July, so you can figure pretty much two, two and a half months from that, these will be up for sale. This is actually cross between a scaleless head and a lesser. So I'm probably gonna keep one of these back, hoping for the scaleless head lesser to kind of work the scaleless head into some of the other things. And here you can kind of see, this is kind of a little bit of mold on the top. It's pretty much, uh, I would say this is perfectly okay. I would say I probably should have vented this and removed some of the humidity from the press and seal. What I kind of like to do is if they're kind of molding a little, kind of reduce 
a lot of the condensation on the sides kind of aired out a little bit and a little bit of mold right on the top doesn't hurt anything and as a matter of fact I've seen some really moldy eggs that look really bad and they hatch okay you definitely know if you have a really bad one because it starts stinking up the place you can smell it instantly so I'd say even though there's just a little mold on that it is perfectly fine so I'm going to replace the present seal on this, and this one was actually two, four, six, seven, seven eggs, so we'll have, looks like we're up to 14 eggs so far between those two boxes, which is pretty awesome. Alright, so here's my third box. This one's supposed to hatch on the 11th of July. This was a cross between my Lemon Blast and my Pastel Desert Ghost. Male, so everything will be 100% Het Desert Ghost, and you'll get pastels, pinstripes, super pastels, pastel pinstripes, super pastel pinstripes, which is your super blast, and you'll get some normals. It'll be quite a variety of different snakes coming out of this clutch. And let's take a look at this. You can see there's you know quite a bit of you know, condensation building up on this press and seal a lot of these and usually I go through and change it a lot more frequently I just kind of did more of an extended uh, didn't really check this uh, it's probably been a month since I actually went through and checked all these so it's definitely time to go through and replace the press and seal there's really not a lot of condensation on the sides on this one and this one is one two three four five six seven another seven day clutch so uh, we're up to uh, 21 eggs so far which is pretty awesome. So I'll put this one back in to cook a little bit longer. All right, so here's my fourth box. This one is actually a pairing between uh, a, a normal 100% head caramel albino female. I wasn't really shooting for the caramel albinos. I just happened to find this really gigantic, it was one of the biggest snakes on Morph Market. I said, I want to buy the biggest female I can just to produce a lot of eggs. And this one just happened to be head caramel. And so everything that it breeds to is 50% head caramel albino. I crossed it with my spider pine, so everything is going going to be 100% het pied, 50% het caramel, and then half the babies will be spiders, half will be normal looking snakes. So it'll either look like a spider or it'll look normal, but it'll have a bunch of re recessive genetics in the mix. And you can see these are actually going to hatch on June, uh, let's see, August 4th. So you're looking at August, September, October, probably the middle of October before these will be ready. And I'm pretty sure this was split between two boxes. These look really nice and pearly white. These look, are looking really good. <clears throat> and what I kind of do is just kind of go through and remove some of the condensation from the sides just to keep it, you know, so it doesn't build up too much. Replace it with press and seal. These are really looking fantastic. It's probably because they haven't really been in here as long as the other ones. The older they get, the kind of the rougher they look until they hatch. All right, so this is the other half of that same exact clutch. Should look almost exactly the same, and the breeding and pairing is exactly the same. This one looks really good as well. These, these eggs look fantastic. It's funny, sometimes you get to the end of where they're ready to hatch and they'll look like they've just been laid and sometimes they'll look really bad. It's, it's pretty amazing. And I haven't quite figured out, I've been bleaching and everything else and you know, it doesn't really seem like, uh, for some reason it seems like some just kind of stay in better condition than others and I'm not quite sure why. Okay, so I have been keeping count and we are up to 31 eggs in the incubator so far. So this is actually a two box clutch. Again, it was a really big one. This was a bamboo crossed with my normal number one. It's interesting, the normal number one is the, the normal I got for free. And everyone's saying, yeah, uh, we think there's something in there because the pattern is really wild on that normal. It's not a regular normal looking snake. And I didn't really think much of it, but um, 
I was surprised it actually laid so many eggs for such a small snake. And this is just half the clutch right here. You can see there, this is the first time she laid. They're a little bit smaller eggs, but 50% of these will be bamboos. 50% will be normals. And assuming there's nothing going on with the normal, no dinker project or anything in here, I'm, I'm assuming these will just be straight normals. These look really good. So we're actually, with these eggs, we're up to 36 eggs so far in the incubator. Be interesting to see how many I actually have because I haven't actually done a running count. I've just been so busy with everything. I haven't even stopped to count my eggs. All right, so here's the other half of that clutch, just the bamboo crossed with a normal. We think it's just a regular normal. And this is four eggs. And these are looking really good too. It looks like this one rolled. So essentially what I want to do is if they roll, uh, <laughs> this one's rolling a lot. Essentially what I want to do is not really move it from the rolled position. So sometimes if they roll, I, I don't really want to move them again to kind of get the embryo up. The embryo, what, from what I've heard, it's kind of a one-time thing if you get it on top and it, it kind of rolls when you first put it in there. You definitely don't want to flip it back over. Once they start developing, they kind of get a certain orientation. So there is four eggs here. Brings us up to 40 in the incubator, which is pretty awesome. So as a matter of fact, last year, actually last year I had a little bit better of a year. I had, I think, Oh, I think I had close to 110 hatchlings. I don't think I'm going to have that many this year. All right, so out of everything I'm producing this year, this is probably what I'm going to hold back. These are, this is kind of my secret project. This is my albino pied cross with a clown, so it's going to be triple hat. These are going to hatch the 13th of August, so I'm going to have a lot of stuff hatching in August. And I haven't had these in here that long, so they should look pretty decent. So she laid, I think, just six eggs on this clutch. It was a really small clown the very first year she laid. So everything in here will be triple het, het albino, het pied, and het clown. As a matter of fact, I went to Morph Market, and I looked up the triple het, and there never was one on Morph Market, which is pretty incredible. And I know the double hats, you know, het albino and het, het clown, they're selling for like 300 bucks at the show. So I'm thinking, you know, a triple het would probably sell for quite a bit more I'm thinking five or six hundred maybe for a triple hat from you know from from this pairing so what I'm thinking is if I get more than one male I might unload some of the males but I'm definitely going to keep all the females from this clutch and this one it's definitely something I'm definitely looking forward to essentially all these snakes will hatch out looking completely normal but they'll carry one copy of each of the recessive genes, albino, pied, and clown. All right, so here's another clutch that I just pulled out of the incubator. This one was actually laid uh, about uh, 12 hours before I found the eggs, so they were all stuck together and I couldn't pull them apart. I tried to pull one, I thought I was gonna rip it, so I just left the rest of them alone. And this is actually nine eggs from, and they haven't actually been in here that long, this is from an albino pied crossed with a pinstripe. So everything is going to be uh, either a normal looking snake or look like a pinstripe. They'll all be 100% het pied, 100% het albino. Pretty powerful breeders. These are supposed to hatch on the 16th of August. So let's see the total so far. We have 46 plus these 9 which would be 55 plus the 10 we pulled today, it looks like we have 65 eggs in the incubator. That's pretty incredible. And I think I have one more snake that might lay. All right, so there you have it. That is what I have in the incubator. Now you kind of know what's coming up as far as hatchlings for sale. And the interesting thing is last year, I was losing probably maybe five to 10% of my eggs due to mold and fungus. And just, you know, not enough humidity. I was really struggling as far as my technique in the, in the incubator in the boxes and everything and I finally got it down kind of towards the end of the year with press and seal and it looks like this year and you know the press and seal is really the trick it looks like I may have a hundred percent hatch rate on all these eggs you know the, the season's progressing really far and I've had a couple boxes actually that hatched out already so I had uh, I have to go back and figure out how many hatchlings I already had so that's 65 eggs in the incubator plus the two boxes that I already hatched out I think I had 
close to 20 some snakes that hatched out already. So I'm up to 65, 75, 85 snakes already this year. That is going to be a really good year for ball pythons. And I bred, let's see, so far I bred 13 snakes and nine of them have laid eggs and they've all been really big snakes laying really big clutches. So I've been pretty fortunate this year, you know, with, with the snakes that have laid eggs. What is this snake doing? So kind of what I'm thinking is if I can figure out, you know, how to kind of set up a bidding system to sell these snakes. I'm thinking maybe you're pricing them below market value. If you can get in, nobody else bids, you get a good deal on the snake. You know, if they go up above market value, I think, you know, maybe you can consider that kind of a donation to the cause. You can help support me financially. I'm not really one to kind of, you know, ask for money. I don't really like to do Patreon or Super Chat or stuff like that to kind of drive the money. Kind of what I'm really focused on is you know make a little bit of money on Amazon associate links and kind of the YouTube ads and make money on the snakes I don't really focus on driving in a lot of revenue from other sources and I, I know sometimes you know <laughs> you take donations and you feel like you have to pay something back especially if you're doing patreon someone gives you a bunch of money and you feel like you really need to give them something in return and this way you can kind of make a donation on top of a purchase you get a really cool snake and you help me out kind of build the business and really you know I'm trying to really expand and build it out and really my kind of my vision is to build it out and bring it into another building where I can kind of expand and what I really want to do is kind of go down in the city where I can get a facility or I can expand a little bit and I have high-speed internet where I can kind of build a command center and do some live streaming and stuff like that which would be pretty cool I can't do it up here in the mountains just because we're restricted from our internet speeds so that is it. I <laughs> look forward to some hatchlings in the near future, and I will see you in the next video.